America had been in conflict with Britain. Most members of the Virginia Convention held the belief that the conflict should be approached peacefully. But Patrick Henry deemed it necessary to prepare for war if Britain does not meet the commands of the colonists. In Patrick Henry's speech in the Virginia Convention, he argued that there is no choice but for America to go to war and break away from Britain by confronting the actuality of how the colonists are being treated and by addressing the harsh reality of what will happen if they do not go to war. It is to be noted that while he is disagreeing with most other people at the convention, he is very respectful and he is still very powerful in this speech, the last lines of which are, give me liberty or give me death. To start off with the speech first, we say that it begins with an obvious introduction where he is disarming the other people. What he is doing right in the first speech is that he is making sure that he does not come off as impolite. In an audience, which might deem you as hostile in an audience where you disagree with most people, it is very, very important to build rapport. It is very important to establish your position in a very polite manner so that you are actually listened to and so that you do not come off as rude and so that you actually give a window for people to agree with you. He starts by saying, No man thinks more highly than I do of patriotism as well as abilities of the very worthy gentleman who have just addressed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights and therefore I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if entertaining as I do opinions of a character very opposite to theirs. I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. Very very nicely and politely he has established his position as opposite to that of other people and he has also claimed authority and said that he will be speaking freely and without reserve because he believes that different men can have different opinions. He says, there is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. A very important thing to note here is how he talks about this question as that of freedom or slavery. This is a common theme that will be repeated throughout this entire speech, so please do look out for that. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Two things. Firstly, he is talking about how the debate should be free so that we can be free. That is a justification that he is giving. The second justification he is giving is that they are responsible towards God and towards their country. But to God first, obviously, because that divine justification is something that is uh, being granted now. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offence? I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty towards the majesty of heaven which I revere above all earthly kings. Again, he talks about the divine justification. It would be disloyal for him to hold himself back. He has to be very, very free and he has to be very, very frank in whatever he's saying because he has that loyalty towards the majesty of heaven. He then says, Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of the siren till she transforms us into beasts. You see the kind of disarming tone he is adopting. He says it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. It is our very nature. So I'm not calling my opponents stupid. I'm not calling my opponents foolish. I'm saying it is just natural of them to do that. But we have to realize that England is like a siren and she's going to transform us into beasts in the future. A very clear visualization that he's putting forward. He says then, Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the numbers of those who having eyes see not and having ears hear not the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. A very important reference he makes when he says having eyes see not and having ears hear not is to the Bible when he says about um, this particular incident is mentioned in Mark 8 verses 18. 
and the entire incident goes like this when jesus asks his apostles why are you debating about having no bread do you still not see or understand do you have such hard hearts having eyes do you not see and having ears do you not hear and do you not remember when i broke the five loaves for the 5000 how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect 12 the apostles answered and when i broke the seven loaves for the 4000 how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect seven the apostles answered and then he asked them did do you still not understand the entire reference that is being made here of having eyes and not seeing is a direct allusion to being disbelievers in god because that is what jesus asks at that particular point do you still not understand do you not see with your eyes do you not hear with your ears do you still not see the power of god and that is the kind of question that is being raised at this particular point to the audience and that is why this biblical reference is amazing because not only is it very very literal and very very directly understandable that allusion is a very very powerful one he then continues with the justification and he says i have but one lamp by which my feet are guided and that is the lamp of experience i know of no way of judging of the future but by the past and judging by the past i wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the british ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house again he is going to attack these adversaries in a way he is going to attack whatever the other people have been talking about but he does that in a very polite manner and in a very very logical manner the appeal right here is that of logos he is very very logically trying to talk about how it is impossible to actually have hope at this point because in the past we have seen that there was no use of having such hope and it would be foolish to continue to have such kind of hope in the future he then asks is it that in situ a smile with which our petition has been lately received trust it not sir it will prove a snare to your feet a snare refers to a contraption for trapping little animals or other critters and the reference here you understand is that of freedom or slavery again a kind of visualization that he is building he is talking about how that insidious smile with which your petition was received it's like a trap and you should not get caught in it suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss again a biblical reference to that of jesus being betrayed by judas ask yourselves how this gracious reception of a petition comports with those wall like preparations which cover our waters and darken our lands our fleets and army is necessary to a work of love and reconciliation have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love let us not deceive ourselves sir these are the implements of war and subjugation the last arguments to which kings resort you see the very clear kind of a messaging that he is doing here he says they might have accepted your petition they might have accepted our petition with a smile a with very very gracefully but what are their other actions like what are they doing on the other hand on the other hand they are also preparing for war they have fleets and they have armies and this is an implement of war and subjugation he says i ask gentlemen sir what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into submission can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it has great britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies you see how he keeps on questioning he keeps on questioning his audience in a very rhetorical manner and he's doing that in a way that he's trying to show that he has trusted the intelligence of his audience he trusts that they can understand everything very clearly they know what he's talking about and that is something that is respectful and that is also something that is better suited for getting his audience which uh, which held very different views from him to his point but then he also continues and says no sir she has none they are meant for us they can be meant for no other so while he had trusted his audience while he had given them all this opportunity to figure it out he very very clearly reinforces his message and says clearly no sir she has none and they are meant for us and not for anybody else he says 
they are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose to them? See the imagery that he continues to build. He talks about binding and riveting with the chains that the British ministry has been forging for a very long time. He talks about a narrative. He talks about for the past 10 years they had been trying things. But what happened? The only thing that the British ministry has been doing is creating, forging chains. And now they are ready to bind them with it. He asks, and what have we to oppose to them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which we have not already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. You see the very polite tone he continues to adopt. He says, I beseech you, sir, I request you, let us not deceive ourselves. He says, sir, we have done everything that could be done to avoid the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation? You see, very clearly he has been asking these questions, then answering them, and that proves as very clear justification for not having any more hope. Again, he reinforces and says, there is no longer any hope, any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left us. You see, he calls their struggle noble. He calls their objective glorious. And then he says how we are appealing to the God of hosts. Hosts refers to angelic warriors. He's referring to how God was commanding this uh, army of angels. And that is the God that we have. We are appealing to that God. We have a glorious object. We have a noble struggle. He continues questioning. He says, They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? You see the kind of slippery slope he had in the beginning. It is obvious that a situation where there's a British guard in every house is not something that's very likely. It's probably impossible. But the way he puts it, it seems probable. He says, when will we be any stronger? It can't be next week or next year if you're not doing anything, if you're disarmed. He says, how are we supposed to gather strength if we do not do anything, if we are completely irresolute? He says, are we going to just lie on our backs and take it? Shall we be hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies have us bound by hand and foot? Again, the allusion to slavery. And also a very embarrassing visualization that he's putting forward of lying on the back and just taking it. A very, very embarrassing position that he's forcing his audience to imagine that they are doing by not taking proper action against the British at this point by trying to go for peaceful means or for petitions, etc. He says then, Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. 
the millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Again, you see the references to God, to the holy cause of liberty. The justification he is, prevent, he is providing is beyond something that is very, very political. He's also going divine here. There's a noble cause involved. He says, besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight for our battles for us. Again, he is giving that uh, entire idea of there being a just God who will help them. The divine rhetoric is continuously there. He then says, The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. By saying that, he's saying that, you know, it's not that we are weak. I'm not trying to say that we are not strong and that is why we lose. But we have to be vigilant. We have to be active. We have to be brave. He's providing these clear calls to action. Then he says, besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged, their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. A very, very clear visualization that he's building here. We do not have an option. Even if we were base enough to desire that, we still do not have an option. Because if we retreat, the only retreat we have is in submission and slavery. And then he paints this very clear imagery of the chains already having been forged and how they can be heard on the plains of Boston, where perhaps it is the British troops that are assembling. The war is inevitable and we have to let it come. In his concluding paragraph, he says, It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. This is again a biblical reference from Jeremiah 6 to 14, uh, which says, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And you see how the reference again is talking about how if you are desiring peace, then that will only lead to a very superficial healing of the wound of the people. The wound being that of slavery. And you need liberty at this point, so you cannot resort to peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. An amazing way to end the entire speech. He begins in a very polite manner and towards the end also he says polite. He says, gentlemen may cry peace, peace. What is it that gentlemen wish? But at the same time you see that at this point he's also emotional. At this point he's also trying to inspire the audience into action. He's very clear with that. He continues with his visualization of the chains and slavery. He also is trying to get them into action by talking about how is it that life is very dear to you? A peace is very sweet to you that you would rather be a slave than to actually go on the fields. Is that what you're trying to insinuate? By doing that, he has already talked about several appeals. He has the appeal of pathos, of logos, of ethos. He talks about how in pathos, it is that our people will be suffering. We will become slaves. We will not have any option but to give up entirely to them if we do not do this. He also has a logical appeal of Logos when he says that it's obvious that they do not want peace when they are building armies in our backyard. He also has the ethical argument when he says that we have a duty towards our country and towards God and that is why we must immediately start working against the British and peace is not an option. And he ends the entire speech by saying, forbid it almighty God. Again, the divine justification is there. The divine appeal is there and he says, I don't know what others will do, but for me, give me liberty or give me death. I would rather be dead than be a slave. And that is the inspiration that he's trying to present to the entire audience to get them into action. And that is why this is an amazing speech, which follows a very good structure. 
and has a lot of rhetorical appeals and will be perhaps one of the best speeches in history. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks a lot.